The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. here with realagriculture.com hanging out at the crop diagnostic school near Swift Current, Saskatchewan. Joining me now is Clark Brenzel. Uh, Clark is a wheat specialist for the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture. How's it going today, Clark? It's going very well. It's been uh, great weather for field day, so it's it's yeah. just been awesome today. We've definitely lucked out. Thanks again for joining us for an episode of our canola school. Uh, we're going to be honing in on iodine herbicide injury, specifically in our canola crops. Now, uh, GMOs are going to be, I think, first and foremost, what come up for producers when we're talking about herbicide injury. Clear up some misconceptions for us about that topic. Um, I think... I think generally the the general public thinks when we're breeding uh, herbicide tolerance into canola that it's it, it's going to be tolerant to every herbicide that that's out there under the sun, and so that that that's going to encourage farmers to apply all these things onto their canola crop to and and make it hazardous to eat at the end of the day, and that the, that's the farthest from the truth. Um, when we're putting inserting tolerance into canola varieties, what we're really doing is we're being very targeted about putting in just the gene that is specific to the tolerance for that herbicide. And so as a result, you put on a very specific herbicide and oftentimes it's a safer herbicide than what we had options for prior to the development of uh, genetically engineered uh, crops. So then kind of switching gears to the producer side that cleared up some things for the consumer side of it. For our producer side of it, um, when they are applying those specific herbicides, it's not likely that we're going to see a ton of herbicide injury if you're applying what it's what that seed is resistant to. In some that there's a bit of gray in there a little as well um, with uh, glufosinate tolerant canola or Liberty Link canola. Um, the level of tolerance in there is very very high. Um, the original glyphosate tolerant varieties, the, the tolerance in those was, was fairly limited. Um, and so as a result, if you have some of those older varieties that you're utilizing um, that have gone off of patent now, uh, or referred to as genuity type varieties, uh, they have limitations as to how much glyphosate that, that they'll take. And they have limitations as to how big the canola can be when they're sprayed. Okay. If you go beyond those rates or beyond that staging, or if you make multiple applications at a little bit elevated rate than what they should be, then you can end up with um, uh, flower blasting and, and white petals and things like that showing up later in the, in the growth of the plant. But now we have TruFlex type varieties, and that, that uh, tolerance for glyphosate is much more robust. Um, still not infinite, so it's not like you can go out there and just put on the highest rate of glyphosate and that, that crop will be fine. Um, but what it does do is it, it opens up that spray window a little bit so that it provides a little more tolerance for misses according to weather and um, if you've got some difficult weeds it allows you to try and adjust your rate a little bit that way to, to make sure that you're able to deal with some of those weeds that you weren't able to at those lower rates or earlier timings. Okay, and so outside of it sounds like that minuscule chance that we'll see that herbicide injury on those specific varieties, where else could producers see uh, herbicide injury? Are we talking drift and other scenarios? The, the most common situations, well there's, there's probably three scenarios that, that could take place. Uh, you could have uh, drift and that would be herbicides moving off target from another field. Uh, you could have uh, soil residue, particularly after the last few years where we've had limited rainfall to be able to break some of those herbicides down in the soil. Um, you could get herbicide from residues residing in the soil uh, or uh, you could get the situation where you've got uh, sprayer contamination as well that um, one of the things that we try and encourage with producers a lot, particularly fellows that are growing canola, is that some of the cases of contamination in sprayers aren't always necessarily the thing that they applied just before they went into their canola. 
Oftentimes, these are things that they sprayed in the burn-off. They may have sprayed last fall and, and didn't get the sprayer cleaned out exactly as well as they could have at that time. Um, a couple of key rules that they can follow with that to make sure that they're not getting sprayer contamination, and we've seen more of that this year than just about anything else, um, is to make sure that they don't leave any chemicals sitting in the tank for more than maybe an hour or so. If they have to stop spraying for any significant length of time, if they have to turn the sprayer motor off and then turn the agitation off, they need to empty that sprayer out and give it at least a rinse out to get rid of all that residue that's in the sprayer. And do that every time that that happens, whether you're going back into a crop that tolerates that again in the future or not. Um, because what happens is often those things accumulate over time, over multiple, multiple acres, to the point where they get caked on the inside of the sprayer. You can go into other sensitive crops with other products that aren't very good tank cleaners and not see any problem, but then you get to something like a Liberty Link canola where you put Liberty in the tank and then you do the same thing, you let it sit in the tank overnight and it does a whole bunch of scrubbing bubbles in the tank overnight. You go in your crop and you spray the next day and you come back a week later and what happened? Why is my crop dead? Right. So things like that, that, that the problem isn't what you did just before, it's what you did way on in the earlier on in the year. And it's just a matter of developing that habit of good practice of management of your herbicides while you're spraying, regardless of when you're spraying sure. and whether you're going back into something that's going to tolerate that and it won't be a problem. For sure, just having those proper checks and balances. Um, also, like you were saying earlier, we are coming out of a couple years of drought in certain areas here in the prairies. Talk a little bit about that carryover. I know that's what you guys are predominantly kind of uh, running the trials with your plots here for. Um, anything we can do to mitigate it or what do we do when we're up against that herbicide carryover? Uh, unfortunately with herbicide carryover that is, is unexpected and that's essentially what we're, we're looking at is that the herbicide breakdown is not behaving as what we would predict under normal conditions and so we're, that herbicide is extending its life in the soil longer than what we would expect. Um, I think the real key thing for producers to try and manage that is make sure they've got good field records so that they know what field had what on it because sometimes in these cases where you've got multiple drought years you've got fields that went that go back two or three years that may have something on it that could this new the crop that you're putting in this year could be very sensitive to um, the other thing is to uh, listen to the people that are saying don't do that uh, and don't go, well, I could do that last year, but I can't do that this year. What's up? I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. Um, there's, there's been a lot of situations where producers have been getting away with kind of cheating on the residues a little bit as well. And when you have a dry condition like we've had over the last few years, you won't be able to get away with that. Um, and the other key thing is that where you're going to see those things show up is not necessarily in another dry year. You're going to see it when that transitions from dry to wet and you start getting those big whopper rains that push that down into the soil and they activate it and they allow it to float around in the soil for the roots of the plants to take up. Awesome. Thanks for all the information today, Clark. You're welcome.